Champions, I'm Amy Morgan, the feature writer for the San Antonio Marriage Initiative. It is my honor today to introduce you to Dr. William J. Doherty, Professor of Family Social Science at the University of Minnesota. He's been the director of both Minnesota's Couples on the Brinks Project and the Citizen Professional Center since 2010. He has been a fellow of the National Council of Family Relations since 2004 and was granted the Lifetime Achievement Award by the American Family Therapy Academy in 2017, as well as an Outstanding Community Service Award from the University of Minnesota in 2005. He's a licensed marriage and family therapist, a licensed psychologist, and a fellow and clinical member of the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Dr. Doherty's recently published The Ethical Lives of Clients Beyond Self-Interest in Psychotherapy with the American Psychological Association. Dr. Doherty is a member of the editorial board for many prestigious publications in the marriage and family field and has worked with couples since 1977. Dr. Doherty will explain how resources he's created, including training in new types of counseling and advocacy, can help professionals and lay people be better equipped to meet needs of couples, friends, neighbors, or clients considering divorce. He'll describe what's different about discernment counseling, how even a friend or relative can learn how to be a better resource, and where the faith community fits in. Dr. Doherty, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I, it was interesting to hear my story there. So thank you for covering so much. Well, you know, you have such a an august career. I, I think we just needed to make sure people understood who they were listening to. So uh, it was important. Thank you. Well, you've been working with couples for decades. Why are you so passionate that people give their marriages their best effort before they call it quits? Well, for most people, it's the most significant relationship in adult life. I mean, it's the one that um, we we um, hope we grow into and, and grow deeper as we as we get older. It's the person we hope will be there for us uh, in in our old age. Um, and um, and and so much of our joy in life depends on how that goes. So at a personal level, marriage is so crucial for, for those who choose it, not necessarily everybody. And then for our society. <clears throat> I call marriage a public good. <clears throat> it, it's a way to kind of stabilize adults, give them a sense of meaning. It's a, the, the best relationship to raise children in. So it's a kind of a bedrock of society as well as a core personal uh, area, of personal uh, of satisfaction and flourishing. That is just so important. And of course, that's what we're, we're all about here at Sammy. Um, I loved this book that you have written, Your Ethical Lives of Clients. Uh, it's one of your newest. And it's, I mean, it's really a textbook for those in the counseling and coaching field. But one of the things you talk about is marriage being an ethical dilemma. Could you describe that for us? Because I, I was very interesting how you said that. Yeah, well, I think of it as an ethical relationship. Of course, that can become a dilemma if you know, yes. depending on if you think of leaving. But it's <clears throat> it's an ethical relationship because it's based on a promise. It's based on a promise of of uh, of lifelong commitment, of fidelity. Um, you know, the better, worse, rich or poor. Um, you know, we, we don't make that uh, uh, same promise to a friend as important as friendship is. Uh, so it involves uh, an ethical core that means that if we're in trouble in our marriage, we, we're obligated to try to fix it. We just, you, you can't you can't see it as a, as a promissory ethical relationship and then walk away because you get tired of it, because you outgrow the other person. Uh, it, you, it, it comes with obligations, is what I'm saying comes with obligations that are moral obligations um, that um, that doesn't get talked about enough. Now, it's, it's easier to, even in our field, we tend to talk about it as, as a place of satisfaction, of fulfillment, of, um, you know, uh, that we bring skills to. Um, but what I'm really doing in that book is to say there's this ethical foundation as well. 
Yeah, well, and it was so interesting because you you kind of give a give an overview and a history of different thoughts of, of therapy and and then you really kind of address that blind spot in therapy, whether it's a coach, a counselor, a, a psychotherapist when it comes to marriage. Could you could you talk about that some more? Because I think our coaches and counselors here would really find this interesting. Yeah, well, we we've moved from <clears throat> Uh, marriage as a social institution, I mean, historically, marriage was not about being in love, not about having your soulmate or your best friend, but about a, a place for economic stability, raising children, and so on. And we moved from that to the, the psychological marriage, uh, which marriage is a, is, is a place for human growth and, and for personal fulfillment, which is fine. But then I think we, we morphed into what I call consumer marriage. And that is marriage as a as a, a chosen lifestyle to make me happy. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so people will talk about what's a deal breaker in their marriage. Deal breaker is is transactional language. So in consumer and uh, consumer culture, everything is transaction. You know, I offer you you're selling something. I've got money. We form a contract together. Um, we both have obligations. If one of us doesn't fulfill the obligation, then you walk uh, or you uh, you buy um, uh, you know like I, I've eaten the Cheerios for my my whole life, but I'm not committed to General Mills. If they change the formula, I'll move on. You know, right? Um, so uh, so my concern is that culturally we've come to see marriage as a as a kind of a, a venue, as I said, for our consumer satisfaction which doesn't include things like sacrifice. You don't sacrifice as a, as a consumer, okay? You, you don't, you know, it's, it's, it's an oxymoron. Um, and that this has entered the, the, the helping professions. Um, and then it's very tempting uh, to see somebody who comes to you for, uh, for help, uh, for a marital problem, uh, to, to, to really take that perspective. You know, is this, is this the deal you thought you signed up for? Uh, and so a very individualistic approach to marriage undermines marriage. Uh, and it's all over the culture. It's professionals, a clergy often, um, uh, and friends, you know, who, who, so we take the side of the individual who's complaining yeah. and we don't take the side of their marriage. Yeah. And you and you said really even like you said in, in the different audiences, you know, whether it be friend, counselor, coach, but you said really even that counselors and coaches aren't really even trained how not to do that. That that right. that, that that's really kind of a the language for that, which you really break down in this book, which I thought was so interesting, is how you were really exhorting the the counselor or the coach should think differently in that if they really were not doing their due diligence, right? if they don't at least introduce or talk about the moral issues of decisions in their client's life. Could you, could you use that, explain that more in your words? Yeah. So in fact, most, uh, most people who seek help uh, who are struggling with their marriage, by the way, most go to an individual counselor, clergy coach, somebody, I mean, and then some do to for couples, but, it's easy to think that marriage counseling is the main venue where people talk about their marriage problems. They talk to friends, family, and individual counselors more than they do together. Um, but most people who, who seek help for their marital problems are, are interested in the ethical dimension. So they've made a commitment. They've made a promise. That's why they're struggling. People don't go to counseling to decide to break up with their old high school friends. OK, it's, you know, they're people that you move on from, um, but they, they get counseling because most people take their ethical commitment seriously. It's the helping person who may not. OK, that, that, that's so it's not like we're bringing an ethical dimension to people who never thought of it. It's the it's the um, it's the blind spots in the helping professions. Um, including a lot of clergy, um, who this one, this person is sitting in front of me and they're hurting, they're suffering, they're in distress related to their marriage. <clears throat> and they tell me about all the things that their spouse has done. 
that makes them miserable. So there's a gravitational pull towards taking their side. Okay, to to uh, seeing them as a three dimensional person and their spouse as one or two dimensions, uh, and um, and then and and to fail to challenge them about their own contributions to the problems because I don't want to alienate them. Okay, they've come to me for help, um, and so so a counselor, even if in their own life, if they take their ethical commitment in marriage very seriously. When they're in that role of the helping this individual, they can be blind to it. And so part of what I say in my book is that the question, what do you need to do for you now going forward? You know, what, what kind of life do you want to have? Uh, do you want to be in a marriage? Do you not want to be in there? What, what's, what work for you? It's an okay question. But if, if the, it's not also with, well, and what responsibilities do you have? And, you know, who's come along with you? If, but that first question, seems like it's a neutral question. In, in an individualistic culture, f- focusing on what do you need to do for you, period, sounds like it's morally neutral. In fact, it's not because you, you came to see me with this commitment you've made. Okay. So, uh, and we know this about children. No, nobody would say to a client who's complaining about their children, well, have you thought about moving on from parenting? <laughs> Okay. Leave them to their own devices. <laughs> I'm very, very cute. I've seen the picture. So I'm sure somebody else might want to adopt them. I mean, you laugh because it's silly, because we still believe in that power of that ethical commitment to parenting. But it's so common, even for a trained professional, to be cavalier about somebody's ethical commitment to their marriage. And since the book came out, I've actually published a research study that's now out, and I could actually send it to you because it's in we paid some money to have it be available to the public, which mm-hmm. documents the, the the prevalence of what I call undermining relationship, undermining comments by individual therapists. Oh, I would love that. Do you, is there a, a, a website or a best? Yeah, yeah, I can send you the link. Yeah. It's the journal family process. And uh, it's the current, you know, it's an issue in the fall here and, and it's open access. But so for example, one of the things that, counselors and therapists will do is offer a diagnosis of your spouse with, ever, with, a, with have, not having met them, okay? Um, narcissistic personality disorder, for example. Another thing they do uh, is to suggest when you get the history of your marriage <clears throat> that it was fatally flawed from the beginning, okay? And you can retrace the origins of almost any marriage, and find the, the the seed of its demise. We were too young, we were too old, but you're on a rebound from somebody. Uh, uh, you were desperate at the time, you, you know, you were just coming off whatever. I mean, you can, you can find it, okay? Um, and then what it does is it demoralizes people because they think, oh, I made the wrong choice. So lots of examples of how that can happen, uh, which really, See, in my view is it doesn't take people real where they are. Most people are serious about not wanting to walk away from the marriage and they're agonizing and they go for help and they often get only one part of their mind gets focused on. And that is their misery and, and their thought that they could be happy if they leave. Yeah. And you also bring up that ethical responsibility to their children. Exactly. Exactly. So the, the longer you're married, the more the more um, people have a stake in your relationship. You know, you're kind of like the hub of a convoy of ships, uh, and so um, so if, if the presence of children, but not only minor children, because children. Well, you've got kids who are over age eighteen. There's this myth out there: you launch them, and then you can do whatever you want with your marriage. Um, it's very painful, uh, uh, demoralizing for so many young people when their parents break up and they wonder about their own future relationships. So I, I, but the reason why in the first part of this, I did not mention children is that I've done workshops where I talk with therapists about this, who agree with me as long as they're minor children around. Okay. But if there are no kids or the kids are gone, then, then it's just a consumer choice. And I reject that. Well, I think it's such, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a really fascinating read. And I would think marriage champions, uh, coaches, counselors, this would be something that you would definitely want to uh, take a look at. But 
it's just one of the breadth of things that you have uh, discovered and resources. Let's pivot a little bit. And we talked, you were talking about counseling. Let's talk about discernment counseling, because that is a very specific count, type of counseling protocol that you developed that is completely different than regular, what people might consider, you know, marriage therapy. Yeah. So could you explain this to our coaches and counselors? I think this would be really important for them to know. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I've identified a kind of couple that we, we've not named before, and I call the mixed agenda couple, that they, they go into counseling and one is leaning out of the marriage, not completely out, but, you know, leaning out and very ambivalent about working on it in counseling, but they're willing to, okay, I'll show up. And the, so leaning out and, the, and we, then you have a leaning in spouse. It's hardly ever the case that two people decide on divorce together. They don't sit down at the kitchen table on a Saturday morning. Yeah, I've been thinking about maybe we should divorce. Yeah, I've been thinking that too. Why don't we? You know, why don't we check it out? No, somebody's out ahead almost always, <clears throat> and uh, and then the other they often don't tell the other person that they're serious until boom, it's almost too late, and then they either won't go to marriage therapy because marriage therapy is designed to improve the marriage, and they're not sure they want to be in it. Okay, um, and maybe they've tried uh, marriage therapy before and it didn't work for any number of reasons. So this is what I call mixed agenda couple. And every therapist knows there are a lot of those out there. And some research hasn't been direct research on it, but certainly 20 to 30 percent of couples who go into therapy, the question of their commitment, somebody's commitment is on the table. And what happens is, and I made this mistake for years, you try to depending on your values and your approach, you either try to talk them into therapy, you know, give it a try, uh, or, hey, I can help you break up or I can help you work in your marriage, you know, tell me what you want. But this person is ambivalent and they don't know what they want. So about 15 years ago, I developed a, an approach uh, that I later called discernment counseling, <clears throat> where you help the leaning out person make a decision that you know, get, get clear about whether they want to work on the marriage uh, or whether they want a divorce. And you help the leaning in spouse really hear what the other one's saying about their pain and bring their best self forward in the crisis mm -hmm. such that their partner may want to do the therapy with them. So we center on three paths. Path one is the one you've been, not get help or divorce. Path two is divorce. And path three is a six month commitment to marriage therapy with a clear agenda for what you're going to work on and divorce off the table. Because part of the problem is that when somebody is leaning far out of the marriage and they're demoralized, they think they only have two choices, either gut it out and be miserable until one of you dies or divorce. And so in discernment counseling, we open up this third path, which would be an all out effort and maybe with other supports, you know, that, that you build in, a six month all out effort to see if you can put your marriage into a good place and then and then make another decision. So the, the paths are different. You're not trying to improve the marriage as you do in therapy. You're trying to improve it, not trying to prove it, not trying to resolve problems, help them to get clarity and confidence about a direction based on a deeper understanding of what's happened to the marriage and each person's contributions to the problem. So you get that last part. Um, most pe people have a narrative, a story about what's happened. Usually, by the way, it's the other person's fault. So you try to help them understand what they've both done together and then each of their contributions to the problems. Last thing I'll say about it is the structure is quite different. Um, most of the conversations are with one person uh, at a time uh, because they're in different places. The leaning out one is often afraid to say everything they need to say because their spouse is sitting there desperate to save the marriage. Um, and the leaning in one is often desperate to save the marriage and they, they make it hard for the other one. Okay. in the, in the, in the sessions. So they come in together, but most of the conversations are separate because they have different agendas. And the thing I learned, and there was a Betty Carter, who was a great uh, pioneer in family therapy. It was when I heard her talk about something like this, that made me go ahead with, because what she said, and this is, this is what we found that people can tolerate that if I'm, if I'm talking to you and you're leaning out, you can tolerate the fact that I'm trying to, trying to help your spouse save the marriage. And when I'm talking to your spouse who's leaning in, 
they can tolerate the fact that I'm not pressuring you. I'm helping you make a decision. They can handle it. They can't handle it if they're in the same room, mm. but they can handle it knowing that I'm working with them differently. So we trained um, lots of folks in this and it's starting to spread around the world as well. Well, and that um, you took me right to the next thing I wanted to ask you, because not only did you develop this protocol and do lots of research that that backed up its effectiveness, you train people. So for our marriage champions, how could they jump into that? How If it, this sounds interesting, they want to find out more. How could they connect with you to become trained? Well, um, so uh, discernmentcounselors.com. Um, and it's for it's for a couple's therapists. So it's, it's to be clear, it's for it's for couples therapists because you have to be able to quickly assess what their dynamics are uh, and you have to be pretty um, strong uh, as a therapist with with each person when you're talking with them. Um, but it's and all the training is available online, self-paced. You don't have to be flying somewhere, uh, you know, stay in a hotel and all that. So it's available online. And we then we um, once people are trained, we have an ongoing community. We have updates. We have we kind of learn, you know, we, we learn as we go. Um, and uh, so uh, and and then, by the way, if they're choosing to do the what we call path three, the marriage therapy, then you can shift into becoming their marriage therapist. OK, but you make a clear distinction. Between discernment counseling, which is about figuring out a path and learning what's happened versus marriage therapy, which is about improving the relationship. What about our marriage champions who, they're not a couple therapist, but they would like to refer somebody to, you know, yeah. somebody to discernment counseling. I'm getting a little bit the cart before the horse because we're gonna talk about how to be a good friend uh, mm -hmm. shortly, because uh, you've got a program for that too. But let's just say, since we're talking about discernment counseling, you want to refer someone to discernment counseling. You yeah. don't feel like you're, you're not, you haven't taken the classes. You're not a couple right. of therapists. How can they connect? With yeah. That? So the, uh, the sister works, uh, website is discernmentcounseling.com. Uh, and there's a national directory and they can read about, can read about those people in their, in their area. And now of course with telehealth, if there's anybody in your state, you can, so discernment counseling actually works well with, through Zoom and other, because so much of it is one-to-one -one conversation. Well, that that is, it just is so interesting. And, and you've had so much research about how helpful it is. And when you you hear about it, it makes such sense. And, and you wonder, well, why did we not do it this way before? But I, I, I'm, a real, I, I'm a real fan. I think it sounds really interesting and very beneficial. Uh, before, we, before we go on, though, one of the advantages is that uh, the leaning out partner is, spouse is more willing to do this than they are marriage therapy. And they only sign up for one session at a time for a maximum of five. So it's an easy, easier entrance ramp for help uh, when somebody is seriously considering divorce. They're signing up for one session each time you decide whether to meet again up to a maximum of five. So they're not signing up for some long-term thing. Well, and that's really nice too. But they, I'm glad you pointed that out because that's a way that the leaning in spouse, I think you help give them some language, right? Yeah. So they can gracefully invite their leaning out spouse to the, right. just the one time. Right. And then actually they can explain it, but send them to the website and people can read. That's what I tell people to do when they contact me and they say, your spouse is thinking of leaving them, send them the URL, the link, and they can read about the sermon counseling. And, and then are they willing to give a session to, to take a good look at their marriage before they make a decision? And this is something, too, that 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 pastors who counsel couples can can get trained and learn how to do. There's right? a pastoral counseling version of it as well. That's right. Uh, where the, the it's one it's really one session and a follow up. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of our, our marriage champions in that role might might find mm -hmm. that interesting. Well, let's back up a little more. Let's say you're a marriage mentor, you're a marriage champion, you're a friend. You have another great uh, tool and a program yeah. to help those of us who, who don't have that counseling degree. So let's talk about your marital first responders. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, the idea of it came from two sources. One is awareness of how frequently people turn to friends, siblings, family, co-workers about the concerns about their marriage. 
uh, they don't go to professionals very soon and sometimes never do, but they talk about it among in their social circle. And, and we did some research on that to show that the you know, majority of people have confided in somebody about a marital problem and that there are all these people out there who are what we call natural confidants. They're the people who others talk to, <clears throat> and but they're, they're making it up as they go. And they get pulled, just like individual counselors do, they get pulled towards the person in front of them. Okay, just like, oh, you poor dear. I can't believe he said that kind of thing, right? Um, then basically undermining the relationship often. Uh, <clears throat> so, and then I learned about something out of Australia called mental health first aid, where they train people um, to in a basic uh, intervention, really for a, a loved one or friend or neighbor who's having a mental health crisis. Uh, and uh, it's been widely used and widely effective. So putting that all together, uh, developed um, Marital First Responders, which is a workshop uh, for natural confidants, for those who others come to them. And of course, the coaches you're describing, the mentors would be perfect, uh, in the skills of, uh, of, uh, of how to support and sometimes challenge uh, people who are dealing with marital problems and not fall in to the common traps, the what I call the unforced errors. Okay, the um, uh, you know I never thought you should have been with him kind of errors. You know, uh, that's when when your sister says that right about you. I'm, I'm thinking of leaving George, and we never liked George. Well, then you guys are lovebirds again in two weeks, and y your sister cannot take that back. So avoiding those unforced errors, uh, <clears throat> l listening for. Uh, the, what we call the difference between hard problems and soft problems. So the hard problems, we, triple A's, abuse, affairs, and addictions. And those are really serious. Uh, and people really need some serious help. Uh, and you shouldn't have to live with chronic cheating and abuse and other things. But that's only a minority of the reasons why people break up. Most of them are the soft problems, the communication problems, the lack of intimacy, the uh, we argue too much, we disagree about the kids, we disagree about money. And so most of the problems that your friends are going to bring you are the soft problems, but people can turn them into major ones. OK, the, the, the hard ones. Right. Um, and so there's we teach people how to normalize problems, tell a story about your own relationship. If you've been through something, um, offer them support, but not not ganging up on their spouse. OK, uh, and then uh, and being willing particularly in multiple conversations, to ask somebody if they've thought about how they may be contributing. Okay, and then if it's serious enough, knowing how to make a referral to a helping professional. So no, because you don't want to be the one who's, you're starting to dread the phone calls because you're going around and around and around. So how to, how to really challenge somebody not to use you as the, as the, the stopgap so you don't become part of the relationship. So it's really, um, it's a fun training. And we, we've done um, uh, some studies to show that people do learn the skills and they do engage more with people in helping their relationships. And the training too, it's available like the other online, correct? Yeah. Yes. And this training is free. Yeah. Um, and um, what we do is we, we, we the train the trainer, the, the, the training to do the workshop is free. Um, and then we ask people to either offer it free or for minimal expenses if you're having coffee or something like that or, or lunch. So so this this way we want to give this away to the world. Well, and that is just such a great way our marriage uh, champions could engage with you. They can and all they have to do is sign up and just, you know, let let you know through your website and then they can take that training and, and online. How long does that training last? Um, well, that's a good question. I designed it some years ago. I don't remember, um, but it, it's, I'm sure it's no more than a dozen hours or so. It's, it, it's, yeah, it's not, it's not that, not that long. Well, and it, it's just a really great way our marriage champions could be trained, could, um, and really be that, that light for others. So, well, you have such a breadth and depth of your work. What are you working on now? What's what's your newest thing? You've got your ethical lives of clients uh, under your belt. What what's next? Well, um, 
Well, one of the things I'm working on is helping couples who are divided by politics in this uh, kind of uh, politically divided, polarized world we're in. Um, and in fact, if people want to see me working with uh, with some couples, they can Google uh, Braver Angels, which is a nonprofit I helped to found. Loved Ones Divided, um, at, at Braver Angels, Loved Ones Divided. And there's, there's four YouTube videos of me uh, working with couples who um, who are having problems over political differences. So that's one of the things I'm working on. Wow. that would I think I've had the opportunity to see a little snippet from one of those before. And it was quite remarkable and, and very timely uh, uh, for, well, for, it seems like there's always an election season, isn't there? Right, right, right. It seems like they, they go on. Well, this has been just great. Dr. Doherty, thank you so much. It's just so interesting to talk with you. You just have so much research and so much uh, experience to bring to the table. So marriage champions, I know that you, uh, that we've had a, a great time talking to Dr. Doherty. Thank you so much for being here. I, it's been, it's been great fun. Yeah, you're such an enthusiastic interviewer that it's a, uh... I feel more energy now at the end than I did at the beginning. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm, I'm so privileged that I get to do this. And Marriage Champions, you know, if you'd like to connect with Dr. Doherty, you can always find us at samarriage.org.